Hello everybody, this is John Broughton from Danfoss. Today I'm making a short video regarding the Optima Slim Pack Condenser Unit. You join me, I'm in my home office in England. We have the Optima Slim Pack Unit behind me here. Um, this is my home office behind that. So we're going to uh, yeah, look around the unit, unbox it and talk about its technical features. So yeah, let's get going. So here we have the condenser unit. Let's just take a little tour around the unit. So at the front there, we obviously have the condenser fan, condenser fan grill. Front access panel with the Danfoss sticker. Coming around the side, we have the side access panel with the data plate information. We have suction and liquid. We have the cable glands connection, service valves at the bottom there. Then if we come around, we have the microchannel heat exchanger condenser. Now this, as I said, is a microchannel heat exchanger. It will use approximately 30% less refrigerant due to its smaller internal volume than thin and tube condensers. Now I have down at the bottom here, which I'll just pick up from the floor, we have a sample heat exchanger that I use for training purposes, just to show how it is made up. Now this is 100% aluminium, very light and uh, very strong. Uh, you can't damage the fins that uh, easily. So we have a header down one side and a header down the other side. Then we have the tubes going across uh, lengthways. And then just to, uh, you'll see these little marks here on the, let's get the camera in the right place. You'll see these little marks here. Now that's actually a disc which controls the flow of the refrigerant through the uh, heat exchanger. So instead of it going, uh, coming in, and then going through, let's say, one tube, it goes through a bank of tubes. Then there's another separation plate, goes along, and so on. So that's how we get the uh, small pressure drop through the condenser. Now, if I just zoom in a little bit, uh, nice and close, get a nice view of the garden. Um, you can see there, maybe if we uh, get a little bit close, it's uh, quite challenged to get it perfect. You can see the very small holes in the tubes that go across. Now that's how we get the high efficiency and heat exchange between our refrigerant that's flowing through the condenser and obviously the ambient air. What I'll do is I'll just turn it over a little bit and maybe we can get a bit of a closer view. Uh, that's a bit closer. So uh, there you can see the holes in the channel that flows through the microchannel heat exchanger. So that's the unit, that's the microchannel heat exchanger. The next thing we'll do is we'll look at the data plate and explain what's in the data plate. So here we have the data plate of the unit. Now it's worth mentioning that in all the correspondence you have with your wholesaler, um, you need to quote the code number, which is the 114X7099 that you can see there in the top left hand corner, but also the serial number down at the bottom there, which tells us everything we need to know about the condenser unit. So if we start at the top, that long number is the model reference of the unit. Then if we come down to the 114X7099, that is the code number. Application there is medium back pressure, IP54, which is the protection of the unit. We have the refrigerants that the unit can work in. Now this one is a 134A513A. Now you'll see that is against a one in brackets and we also have a two in brackets. These units are multi-refrigerant, so they can use a variety of refrigerants and all the refrigerants that they can work on will be listed on the data plate. Please don't use a refrigerant in the unit that is not listed on the data plate because you will void your warranty and shorten the life of the compressor. So looking, we have the, the maximum working pressure on the high side and the low side. Again, we have a one in brackets and a two in brackets, depending on the refrigerants that the unit is approved for use with. They may be different pressure ratings for other refrigerants, which would be listed there against the two that is in brackets. We have the voltage, which is 230 volts, one phase, 50 cycles. The locked rotor amps, 12.4. The MCC, which is the maximum continuous current, which is 3.47 amps. The oil inside, depending on the model of the condenser unit, there will be, or there could be, uh, the oil listed that is inside the compressor. This unit has a small black Danfoss compressor inside so that uh, oil information is not applicable on this particular unit. We have the serial number there. Now the last four digits of that serial number, you can see there 4221 is the week and year of manufacture. So this is week 42, 2021. The EAN is the European article number, which is a uh, code that has to be printed on all products that come into the European Union. And then below that we have the various 
approvals of the unit. Now, if we talk about the designation, the top long number, the OPMSGM number, basically the OP is uh, Optima, the M is a medium back pressure, the S is a slim pack, so that's the condensing unit family, G is the refrigerant, now in this case, as we said, that's 134A, 513A, the M stands for microchannel, the 012 is the displacement of the compressor in cubic centimetres. We have the compressor platform, which is the SC. The W05 is the version number. And then the G is the electrical code. And in this case, that stands for 230 volt, one phase, 50 cycles, as we said before. So that is the data plate. Now let's take the panels off and take a look inside. So here we have the unit we've now unboxed. We've took the, the top cover off and the side panel off. Just a few screws to uh, open up the unit. So as we walk around, obviously that's our uh, condenser fan inside the plenum chamber with the microchannel, etc. You'll notice the microchannel itself is not actually um, secured. Um, it's actually fitted with a, a rubber gasket and then in some, uh, yeah, I wouldn't quite call them clips, but locators. Uh, the microchannel will expand and contract with uh, with temperature slightly. Um, so coming down the front, obviously, we have our grill again. We then have our electrical components, which we'll go through in a little bit more detail. We have our compressor down the bottom. Most importantly here, we have our instruction information regarding the uh, condenser unit that is supplied with the units in various languages. So, you know, please read the information that is supplied. I'll just put that down there. Um, obviously, we've got our compressor, we've got our uh, dual pressure switch there, HP LP, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. We've got the receiver in the back there, we've got a 100% molecular sieve filter dryer. We have a sight glass down there which is showing green, which is nice because that means it's nice and dry. The unit is supplied with one bar holding pressure of dry nitrogen. So when you are starting to install your unit and getting to the point of actually connecting up the, uh, the pipe work, there should be one bar standing pressure inside. If there isn't, then please contact your local wholesaler to discuss further. Um, yeah, we've got the, the service valves there. I've got my four millimeter Allen key to show you. Um, that's the size of Allen key that you need to operate. I've took one of the uh, service caps off there, look, and uh, that is a shredder connection for your gauges. Other things to note, we've took the, uh, the side panel off You'll notice there on top of the compressor, we have a label, which basically gives the same information as on the data plate. So the, the model reference, the OP number there, the 114X number of the condensed unit and the serial number. So we can match that compressor with this condensed unit. We also have a label on our condensed unit here, which again is the 114X number. And that is the tested uh, date. So we know when the unit was tested in the factory. Um, just coming down to the panel that I've taken off, on the inside of the panel we have a wiring diagram for the unit. So yeah, that's always uh, a good thing to know. Sometimes I get calls from people saying there's no wiring diagram. Well, it's on the inside of the door, uh, so that is useful. We spoke about the oil earlier on the compressor. Now here we have the data plate of the compressor. There is no oil information on this compressor. There's no oil sight glass. The oil inside will be a POE. If you need to uh, add some oil due to the pipe length of your unit, please speak to your local wholesaler and they will advise you on the correct oil to use. Um, you'll notice on the compressor here, we have the crankcase heater taken around the top of the body. Now that is absolutely fine. That will do its job and keep our compressor nice and warm in a cold ambient. The reason that it's not uh, down the bottom here is because of the electrical components. Um, you can just sort of see the uh, the capacitor uh, around there, which is uh, yeah basically in the way. So that's why we put the crankcase seat around the top. Crankcase seat does, does, does a very important job. Before you start up the unit, make sure the crankcase heater is energized for at least 12 hours. Uh, we want that compressor nice and warm and we don't want any moisture in the oil itself. So that's the, uh, that's the unit. So let's come around. Talk about the pressure switch a little bit more. So we have a HP LP 
adjustable pressure switch on here. It is delivered in an auto auto situation with this little uh, setting here. You can uh, alter that depending on what you want for your application. We have the low side here and the high side here. It is set roughly uh, for the refrigerants, but it will need to be adjusted on site for your particular application. That's uh, most important. Um, what else have we got? Um, as a general comment regarding condensing units, I would always make sure that when you are doing your initial um, commissioning on the unit, I would check all the electrical connections, make sure everything's nice and tight, make sure all the service valves are in the correct um, position. So yeah, that's that part. We'll talk a little bit more in detail now about the electrical side. So here we have the electrical connections within this condensed unit. Now it's worth mentioning two things before. There is no mains power onto this particular condensed unit. So I feel quite happy with my fingers pointing out various components within it. And obviously depending on the model of unit, the electrical box will look different. Obviously single phase, three phase, and also the region that the unit will be sold in. So we can focus on this one, but if you look in uh, obviously Another unit, it will look slightly differently. So if we go left to right here, we have uh, our connections along here. We have our overload for our compressor, which is factory set, that's set about 3.2 amps. We have our compressor contactor, mains incoming, MCB, so mains would be in, in at the bottom. Then we have some more connections here, which go out to our LP switch and an alarm signal, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then just going back up here to C3, we have the capacitor for the condenser fan motor. Now, there's a couple of ways we could operate this condenser unit. We could have it on basically thermostat on off. If we were to do that, this link here, which is three and four, that would be wired to our thermostat. So when the thermostat calls for cooling, the unit would start. And when the thermostat is temperature satisfied, the unit would stop. The other option would be to leave that link in on three and four and then wire our thermostats to our solenoid valve in the liquid line and then when we require cooling the solenoid valve would open, suction pressure would rise and we would cut in on the LP, unit would run. When we're temperature satisfied the liquid line solenoid valve would close and the unit would pump down and cut out on LP. It's your choice on uh, how you make the system work. The benefits of using pump down, particularly on deep freeze applications, are well documented. Um, but again, that is uh, you know your choice uh, to say. So we've covered the thermostat connection on on three and four. Some uh, other extras we could fit. We have a connection there five and six. Now this is a medium back pressure unit. If it was a low temperature unit, I would personally suggest, particularly on R four four eight, R four four nine would be to fit a discharge gas thermostat kit which would attach to our discharge pipe and it would safeguard our compressor in the event of uh, a high discharge temperature situation which could be a faulty condenser fan, could be a block condenser, could be uh, low charge, could be high suction superheat coming back to our machine. So that's one option. The other connections that are worth talking about is 12, 13 and 14 on here which gives us the ability to wire out an alarm signal from our pressure switch to a uh, flashing light, beacon, etc., for our end user, so that if a unit did trip on HP, for example, he would be notified. Um, that's something to mention. The other thing to mention, this is a, a UK unit. It's not fitted as standard with a fan speed control. There is a pressure connection on all the units, and we can see it on this one here. It's uh, on the liquid line here, which is a uh, Schrader connection, which we could fit our fan speed control to, and that fan speed control then be wired into the unit as per the instructions. Now, why do we use a fan speed control? Well, in the UK, we have low ambient temperature. In the winter time, if the fan was running at 100%, then we would have low head pressure, and we would have a small pressure drop or small air pressure drop across the expansion valve and we would struggle struggle to have refrigeration. So if you are installing the unit in a colder climate, let's say, then a fan speed control would be recommended. Obviously, if you're in the Middle East, Far East, um, then it's not needed. 
due to the, unless you have a very high, uh, let's say, swing in ambient temperature between daytime and, and nighttime. Um, so that's really the electrics of the unit. Let's uh, talk about the installation and commissioning next. Hello, so we've looked at the unit, we've looked at the features of the unit, the electrical connections, etc. Now I'd just like to say a few words really regarding the installation and the commissioning process of the condensed unit. Um, this is, you know, whether it's a Danfoss a slim pack, whether it's a Optima Plus, etc. These are all the things that we should be doing on a, uh, on a on a normal basis when we're commissioning a system. So if we think about the system itself, when we're connecting up the pipe work, keep the unit, the condensed unit sealed as long as we can before we actually connect up uh, to avoid moisture getting into the compressor oil. The polyester oil that's inside most modern machines nowadays is very hydroscopic and will absorb moisture very, very quickly. So we need to keep the system sealed for, for uh, as long as we can before we actually connect up. Um, make sure we pull a good vacuum, make sure we do a good pressure test, leak test, etc. Um, the vacuum is incredibly important. We don't want any moisture in the system. As I said, that moisture will um, go into the oil and then the oil loses its lubricating qualities and then we shorten the compressor lifetime. So things like pressure test, uh, leak test, etc., and vacuum are very important. They're the basics of a good installation. The other basics of good installation is the correct pipe size, both suction and liquid. We need to get the oil back to the compressor. The compressor, by its nature, will pump oil out during uh, its function. So we need to ensure that the pipe sizes are correct. We can use the Danfoss Cool Selector software to check the pipe sizes and make sure we have the correct velocity. Uh, in a vertical line, we're looking around about uh, 8 to 12 meters a second, and in a horizontal line between 4 and 8 meters a second on the suction line to ensure we get good um, oil back to our compressor. Make sure we have the suction line fully insulated with the correct thickness of insulation, depending on whether we are medium temperature or low temperature. Obviously, if we're low temperature freezer room, for example, the suction gas coming back to the machine will be colder. So we need thicker suction insulation than we would on a medium temperature, uh, you know, plus three degrees refrigerator, for example. Um, just while we're talking about things like the pressure test, make sure we pressure test with dry nitrogen, never test with oxygen. That is a explosion risk, flammability risk. So that is incredibly important. Um, yeah, then we have a uh, good installation. So we have the, either the evaporator or the display case connected onto the other end of the condensed unit that's behind me. We need to ensure that the system is balanced. That should be done during the selection process between the condensed unit and the evaporator or evaporators, you know, cold room or display case, etc. Make sure we install the thermostatic expansion valve correctly. Make sure we set up and adjust the thermostatic expansion valve during the commissioning process to ensure we have the right level of superheat on the evaporator. Make sure we have the right level of suction super heat coming back to the machine so we don't damage our machine. Um, make sure that we have good airflow around the condensing unit. Make sure there's no vegetation, um, such as my piece of bamboo behind me. Um, you know, that's going to grow and we need to ensure that that doesn't block the airflow on the condensing unit itself. Um, airflow in the cold room, that is incredibly important. Make sure we have enough space behind the evaporator to give good, good airflow. Um, if it is a, a freezer room, make sure we have good defrost management, things like that. So there's a lot more that, uh, you know, we can talk about. So yeah, I look forward to seeing you all again. Thanks very much.